Thanks to Pedro for inviting me and my co-authors, which is a significant number, as you can see, um, for allowing us to come here and speak today on the overview of the Cerdariomycetes. So most people, when they think about the class Cerdariomycetes, they think of the traditionally common name, the perinomycetes, right? So most of these things occur as parathesia, although there's a few cleistothesial genera out there. Um, most of them occur singly, um, although some can be clumped together in, in stroma and be quite large. Um, but the majority of these things are less than one millimeter in diameter. So little tiny black dots is, is what I usually refer to them as, because um, most of them are dark colored and, and black in color. Although there are a few taxa, especially those in the hypocreales, that actually have some nice color to them as well. Um, the assi within this group are interperculate and unitunicate. Typically, they contain eight axial spores, although a few taxa, such as pedospora, contain multiples of eight. Um, the ascus tips can be quite interesting and large in some of the genera. Um, especially in the Xylorales, they can stain blue and have an amyloid reaction. Um, sterile threads called paraphyses occur throughout most of the group. And there's a very large, wide range of ascosporm sizes and shapes. So large diversity here um, <clears throat> at the microscopic level. This is where it's really interesting. And most of the classification has been based on ascosporm morphology for the most part, um, especially at the genus level. So this group occurs, a lot of them occur as saprobes on bark, stems, wood, and soil. And one of my more favorite substrates is dung. <clears throat> Not just elephant dung, but all types of dung of herbivores. They also occur as pathogens of plants, uh, animals, and other fungi. Um, and you find the, uh, what we refer to as the fruit flies of the fungal world, at least I refer to it that way, is the model genetic organism, Sorderia formicula and Podospora uh, ansorina, Neurospora crassa occurs within this group as well. So the Sorderiomycetes presently contains three subclasses, um, 20 orders, more than 60 families, somewhere around 2,200 generic names occur throughout the class. Um, According to some of the registries, uh, around 1,240 are excluded, 50 are dubious. There's more than 900 synonyms so far. Um, it's quite a, very, quite a large group in that there's over 10,000 species that occur throughout this group. So what we have shown here are the orders that occur in the subclasses with the putative number of families that occur um, in each order given in the parentheses here. So the today subclass has somewhere around seven orders. There's eight orders in Sorderiomycetidae, um, and Xylariomycetidae has Xylariales, so for the most part. <clears throat> and then we have some Incertacetus um, orders down here that are um, relatively small. There's not a lot of members within these, this group. All right, so... <sighs> To set up this talk, I wanted to basically highlight what I consider one of the more foundational fundamental papers. Um, so this was one by Zhang et al. Several of us here were co-authors um, on this paper. This was in the Deep Hypha issue of Mycologia in 2006. Um, and what we did was sample um, 106 taxa, um, representing 13 orders and 85 genera. The type species for 49 genera were included in these analyses, which analyzed um, your ribo typical ribosomal genes, the nuclear small subunit and large subunit, along with translation elongation factor and RPB2. So um, I'll refer back to these numbers a little later. Um, but this really was sort of the more foundational paper for establishing some of the family and order level relationships in the, in the class. So if we <clears throat> take a look at what we got available and you do some searches in GenBank, um, what you'll find out is um, if you go to RefSeq or the Reference Sequence Database, there's about 522 nuclear large subunit um, sequences that are available for the type specimens <clears throat> in the class representing type species of approximately around 200 genera. And they kind of break down more or less like this throughout the subclasses. If we look at all the sequences in GenBank, there's almost 5,000 uh, small subunit ones that I estimate represent around 100 genera of type species. 
about 2,300 for translation elongation factor, representing around 80 genera, um, over 5,000 for RPP2, uh, representing around 110 genera, and then last, um, MCM7, which is kind of the new kid on the block, um, has a lot of sequences, almost 500 sequences, um, but this has been done for a lot of the same similar species to uh, differentiate species complexes. Um, and it only represents about 90 genera and 26 type species. So if you go to JGI and want to look and see what uh, has been had whole complete genome sequenced, um, there's 60 taxa representing type species for 11 genera. So um, Joey just gave a really nice talk on genome sequencing in Dothidiomycetes. That's where we would like to be someday in the sort area of mycetes as well. But um, obviously we're just not there yet for, for having that amount of molecular data. Um, so what we were able to end up doing was rep um, gathering representative taxa for 16 of the 20 orders um, for this talk. So there's two primary questions we were interested in. Um, <clears throat> the first one was what asexual genera are most closely related or even synonymous with the sexual genera? And this, of course, goes along with the one, species, or one fungus, one name concept. Here we were more interested and sampling as many genera as possible, just get where we can, and less concerned about that deep, le deep level support along the backbones for distinguishing higher level taxa. Um, the second question, of course, is where we're more interested in the phylogenetic relationships among these higher level taxa, families and orders in the class. Um, so here we're less interested in sampling genera with just limited data. We really need a certain amount of data in order to uh, give some support along the backbone. And we are more concerned, of course, about these deep level, uh, deep level support along the backbone and for us to be able to say anything at all about relationships at the higher levels. So taxon sampling followed this philosophy. <clears throat> the goal was to include the type species for each of the 1,204, uh, 12, excuse me, 1,240 genera in the sort area along with one additionally closely related genus. And um, this kind of follows a little bit how what Joy had just got in saying about he wanted to sample two from every family. Um, I always feel much more confident when I can sample two things <clears throat> um, in different times and space. So that might be a different specimen from a different lab, but at least it's been sequenced twice. Um, you seem to have much more confidence if they come together um, that way. So the priority for taxon sampling was um, fairly straightforward. Of course, the gold standard is to try to get molecular data from the type specimen of the type species, obviously. If that doesn't work, you look for an epitype or authenticated material. Um, if that's not available, another collection of the type species, um, the non-type specimen would work. Um, and then another collection presumed to be closely related. And then the last one is, is the uh, catch-all. Um, just get anything that you possibly can for that genus that has molecular data, right? <clears throat> So, and the molecular data pretty much followed Zhang et al, um, except we added the MC, whoops, we added the uh, MCM7 gene, sorry, <clears throat> the MCM7 gene as well um, to, our, to the genes that we selected. Um, we haven't added beta tubulin or RPB1 yet, um, but there's plans for the future. So this is all a work in progress right now. Obviously none of this is, is publishable. <clears throat> all right, so, when I first came out of uh, graduate school with my PhD, um, I was a phylogenetic wizard, or so I thought, right? Like many of us, uh, we were at the top of our game when we came out of school. I, I, had, I knew the latest techniques in phylogenetic analysis. <clears throat> um, fast forward about 12 years later, and the tools in my toolbox have become a bit rusty so far, right, and limited. So <clears throat> the smart thing to do is to go out and get people that actually are doing the latest things and, and know how to do this. So the brains behind the trees are these two people. Um, Tandy Warnow, which um, has just recently come to the University of Illinois. We actually went out and headhunted her from the University of Texas, gave her a bunch of money and a fancy title, and she's been at the University of Illinois for about six months so far. So she's most famous for the avian phylogenomics project. She was a co-author on that, did a lot of the help with the phylo phylogenies of that. That was published in Science last year. <clears throat> um, her, along with her postdoc Nam, um, also work on the thousand plant transcriptome project um, that was published in PNAS last year. 
Um, NAM is, an, on, in addition, is also a key developer of the alignment program PASTA as well, so that some of you may be familiar with. Um, but that's what these guys do is really large data sets with a lot of data, um, mostly genome level, um, although <clears throat> they're willing to work on fungi because they've yet to actually work, uh, analyze fungal data sets. So they were excited to, to uh, start working on, on that kingdom for analyzing molecular data. So basically, here's the methods um, that they ended up running. Um, alignment esti estimation by removing taxa that had less than n number of genes, and I'll show you what I mean by this um, a little bit later when I show some of the trees. They estimated pasta alignments for each tree, generated um, bootstrap replicates, um, and then proceeded on with what we did with can concatenation analyses, <clears throat> which basically uses uh, fast tree maximum likelihood. Um, um, on the concatenated al alignments and then estimated 100 bootstrap maximum likelihood trees on these alignments. Um, we didn't have time to get to the coalescence analyses using Astral or any type of Bayesian analyses, but this will be done on the final data set as well. So, all right, so this is an oversimplified graph <coughs> that um, basically shows the, uh, the number of genes sampled per taxa um, versus the number of supported nodes, right? And as you can, as you can guess, um, as you sample more and more genes per taxa, your support along that backbone goes up. At least that's what, the, that's what you hope it does. <coughs> so our first data set that we put together, the largest one, sampled one to five genes. So anything that had a single gene all the way up to five genes um, represented 610 taxa, 417 genera, um, and 240 type species, okay? So that's a good thing. The downside was we didn't have a lot of data for a lot of the taxa. So there was only one single node on the entire backbone of the tree that was supported, right? So not very useful there. Um, and then we threw out everything that had a single gene and analyzed everything that had two to five genes in it. <clears throat> 397 taxa, almost 300 genera, and 182 type species. Here, 88% of the nodes were supported by bootstrap value above 50%, so we're getting much better support. And then last but not least, um, we threw out everything that had just one and two genes and look, analyzed everything that had three, four, or, and or five genes. Um, that gave us a data set of 232 taxa, 181 genera, and 98 type species, okay? And I'm happy to say that every node um, along the backbone of the tree was supported by bootstrap value at 70% or above. So that was a nice, well-supported tree. Um, the one thing I'll point out here is that even with our very smallest data set that we ended up with, it still doubles the number of taxa, the number of genera, and doubles the number of type species that have been um, studied since the Zhang et al. paper in 2006. So over a nine-year period, we're actually progressing. We, we are getting somewhere. Um, which is good. So as you can imagine, um, this first data set is probably okay for answering question number one when you're only interested at those relationships at the tips, mostly uh, similarity type relationships, what's uh, most close or you know, what's the same thing. Um, but the next two data sets are more appropriate for answering question number two about those higher level relationships between families and orders. All right, so I was, I was forced with a decision to make then. Which tree did I wanna show? Um, did I wanna show the two to five gene tree or the three to five gene tree? <clears throat> and um, the logical thing to do would be to pick one of these trees and, just, and go over it at a reasonable, normal pace. Um, I decided not to go that route. I'm gonna show you both trees and I'm gonna talk about them very, very fast. All right. Unless I can just talk through uh, John's, John's time, but probably. That wouldn't be polite, so. <clears throat> All right, so um, we're gonna start at the top of the tree and we're gonna work our way down to the, to the base of the trees. <coughs> so this is at the top here, and again, what I'm showing <clears throat> is taxa with two to five genes sampled. Um, again, about 400 taxa representing 300 genera, 182 type species. Um, here are the five genes listed. The numbers under this correspond to how many of those genes were actually represented in the, in the final data set. So 88% of the nodes were supported by bootstrap value. Um, I did everything I can to make the type species stand out. So they're bold, they're italics, and they're even larger font. Um, you can kind of see those versus the ones that are, that are not. Um, 
but it gives you kind of a quick overview. You can kind of quickly look and see um, where the type species are. Um, and in this, in this tree, the gray boxes indicate single lineages of uncertain, or uh, those with uncertain placement. We're just not exactly for sure what those are. So, um, so ignore this nectariaceae that occurs out here in the Xylariales. I'll talk about that a little bit later in the next tree. Um, but basically with this data set, when you're sampling two to five genes, um, your Xylariales, you have the Apiosporaceae, the Amphoceraceae, and the Xylariaceae that kind of come out and split. Um, they do sort of some weird things <coughs> um, along with the Xylariales at the, at the base. So moving down the tree, we have this sort of historical groups that's always sort of floated around the tree in the Sorderum I see today in Cetus. Um, the annulet Tascaceae has never been really happy anywhere. It always seems to move around and, and is never really monophyletic, monophyletic for the most part, <clears throat> but there are people working on that. Um, we received some very nice data sets of the Ophiostomatales, and it behaves itself. It's a nice, well-supported monophyletic group, as is the Magnaporthales. The Sorderales is a monophyletic group, but without support in this analysis. Um, it, of course, comes out nice in the, you know, the lazy sphere AC, ketome AC, and sorter AC like it should. Um, most of this stuff looks nice. It behaves itself. The bolineales, ketospherales, coniocetales, um, diaporthales, and calospherales are all um, monophyletic groups. Um, some are not well supported, <clears throat> but nonetheless, they still come out monophyletic. So um, this is a recent order that Martina Brablova described. Um, you can ask her for the pronunciation of, of that name. I'm not for sure <laughs> what it is. I'll stick with the ones I know. Um, Hypercreales comes out in a nice, well-defined monophyletic group, um, as does the Microrascales as well. And we still got some Microrascales here. Um, and then we have the Coronophorales, um, in which uh, Melanospora um, jumps inside of there. Um, some people tell me that's maybe not a real group. Um, maybe it doesn't belong there as well. <clears throat> And then we kind of just have this hodgepodge of other things in the hypocreomyce today that seem to float around along with uh, things in the Sorderiales. The Savoriales and Ludworthiales comes out um, nice as well. And then our finally our outgroups in Laotiomycetes and Dothidiomycetes. So um, for anyone that's a Sorderiomycetologist, they like to see Xylariales at the base of the tree. That's where it should be. Um, but before I did all this pretty coloring, I forgot to swap the branches. So that's just a branch swapping thing. So Australia is at the top of the world, right? So kind of think of it that way. But just ignore that. It's just a branch swapping thing. All right. So I'm going to go on to the, the, the tree I like the best. This is the, uh, the tree that has three to five gene sampling. And of course, it reduces our number of taxa down a bit um, to 232 taxa. Um, 181 genera and 98 type species. Um, again, this is the number of genes that's been sampled along here. Um, but the nice thing is, is every node is supported by bootstrap value, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the first thing we wanna do, um, and again, I wanna point out this is a preliminary tree. No one would ever publish anything that looks like this. The Nectariaceae <clears throat> is up here at the top and not with the Hypercoreales. That's very weird. <clears throat> Not exactly for sure what was going on there, although Conrad and I did figure it out at 11 o'clock last night in our hotel room. And the final determination was it's all Lorenzo's fault. All right, so. <laughs> Sorry, Lorenzo, I gotta throw you under the bus. What's going on here is I did not go back and look at the TEF alignment like I probably should have. And Lorenzo is sequencing the five prime end of the translation elongation factor and everyone else sequences a three prime end, okay, so the more conserved region. So what we ended up with was just that one gene when it, when it gets sampled, it does a great job putting the nectaraceae all together because you're sequencing that part of the gene, but you're trying to analyze it saying that it's, an, it's homologous with another part of the gene and that just doesn't work. So a very easy solution to fix this. All we do is just throw out all of Lorenzo's data and we add the data that actually corresponds with homologous characters in the translation elongation factor. So. Um, although I tried to throw him under the bus, it was my fault. I should have probably recognized that. And we did at 11 o'clock last night. So, <clears throat> all right. So anyway, then we have the Sorderomycetes today in Certicetus and the Annulatascaceae that seems to still group together, um, albeit not in a monophyletic group or well-supported, but we're getting better resolution there. The Ophiostomatales behaves itself again like it did in the last tree, as does the Magnaporthales, very nice, well-supported group. 
Um, Diaprothales, very nice, well-supported group. <coughs> um, Calispheriales is now supported in this analysis. Uh, Coniocutales, Cutispheriales, Bolemiales, and Sorterales are all nice, well-supported monophyletic groups. Um, they always belong together um, in all analyses. They always come out together, and they do here as well. So, um, and then again, the Microrascales comes out as a nice, well-supported monophyletic group, and then all the Hypercreales as well. Um, at the base of the tree, we see very similar things that we did last time with the Coronophorales. <coughs> um, this actually isn't Halosphereaceae anymore, so there's some nomenclatural issues we just need to kind of kind of clean up. Ludworthiales and Savoriales comes out um, together. Um, a couple other things that I believe probably have new names to them. Um, this is probably some older um, taxonomy, actually. Um, and then again, the Xylariales comes out here as a nice, well-supported monophyletic group at the base of the tree, which uh, should make everyone happy. So, all right, so just to summarize, um, all 16 included orders are recognized and most of them are are well supported so far. Um, families and orders that have historically occurred as well supported monophyletic groups in previous analyses uh, for the last 10 years continue to hold together. So that's um, not a, <clears throat> not a uh, huge statement there. Um, as is this statement here about several groups with limited study, they still remain unsupported, um, even though you add more taxa and more data to it. They still like to float around the tree without really good placement um, so far. Um, what we were able to find is five genera that were previously placed within the class Incertisetus. They seem to have found a home now in some of these monophyletic groups. Um, there was even two genera that were placed in Ascomycota Incertisetus, right? We, no one had any idea where they belonged, apparently. Um, and they've now found a home as well in the class Cerderiomycetes. So, um, like I said, this is a work in progress. We have a lot of collaborators on this project. Um, we're looking for more. So if anyone's interested in contributing, um, in fact, as we speak now, there's still some collaborators that's out generating more sequence data to contribute to this, to this uh, paper. Um, we've only sequenced uh, or only included 20% of the genera have been represented so far. Um, I didn't add these four Incertisetus taxa. We'll go back and add whatever genetic uh, molecular data is available for those. Um, and we're still looking for more sequence data and additional genera. Like I said, we'll probably, now knowing that you adding just one more gene to the analysis makes a big difference, we'll probably go back and add beta 2 and RPB1 um, uh, to include as, as many uh, genes as we can for this. So just to conclude, um, since this talk is dedicated to Emory Simmons, this whole workshop is dedicated to Emory. Um, I think you've already seen this slide once. <coughs> Meredith has, has thrown this in. Um, I actually live 90 minutes away from Emory. So um, it's a pleasure to uh, have him come over and visit us before. It was also very nice to go over and, and be able to visit him at his house and see his laboratory in his basement. Um, and as Meredith pointed out, there's no good restaurants in, in town. So we did get to go out to his, his favorite lunch place, though. It's about 10 miles outside the town and enjoy uh, some time 